Welcome to the PR Maven podcast, a podcast all about growing your network and building your brand through traditional and digital networking techniques. I'm Nancy Marshall, the PR Maven and CEO of Marshall Communications. I've been strengthening brands through PR for over 35 years, and now I'm celebrating the success of executives, influencers, business owners, and entrepreneurs from all around the world, all of whom have cultivated their brands and broadened their networks through traditional and digital networking methods. Each week, I interview one of these interesting and influential individuals and provide an opportunity for you, the PR Maven Nation, to gain insights from their strategies and stories. So stay tuned for this week's episode, and thanks for listening. I'm Nancy Marshall, the PR Maven, and I have been working in PR throughout my long career, and I have a special interest in personal branding, which is what makes you stand out from everyone else who does the same thing that you do, and it attracts people to what you have to offer. I'm a keynote speaker, an author, and a columnist with the Forbes Agency Council and Main Biz. My audiences have said that helping them think about their superpower has changed the way they think about their careers and their lives. I'm very excited about my guest today, and I hope you like this episode. And if you do like it, I hope you'll share it with others who might be interested. With me today is Stephen Church from Copywriter Pro. Welcome to the PR Maven podcast, Steve. Well, thank you, Nancy. I've been so looking forward to this. And I must congratulate you on your on your perspicacity because do you realize you've been so appropriate? You have invited me on your podcast during um, what is Freelance Writers Appreciation Week. And that's absolutely true. And so thank you for that. And I've got a LinkedIn post going out tomorrow about Freelance Writers Appreciation Week. How about a LinkedIn post about perspicacity? Perspicacity. Yes, yeah, it's one of those words I use to impress. I haven't got a clue what it means, but I hope you're and your viewers are <laughs> newly impressed. That is that is quite a word, Stephen. <laughs> So Stephen Church's love for languages began when he was at school. English was easily his favorite school subject. And at university, he studied psycholinguistics, which is how language and the different ways it's expressed makes us behave in different ways. Stephen spent several years as an English language tutor working overseas in Madrid, Iran, Afghanistan, Saudi Arabia, and London. In the early 1980s, he came back to the UK, where he is now, to join his long-established family retail business, selling china, crystal, and collectibles. The business was very quick to make use of the internet, launching their first website in 1996, followed by a full-blown e-commerce site in 2005. During this period, Stephen learned about commercial copywriting and the importance of SEO, search engine optimization. Sadly, in 2012, the business closed. This gave Stephen the opportunity to explore working in a field that he always loved, language. Copywriter Pro was born, getting growth-minded business more and better quality clients by writing words for their websites that are clear concise and compelling. So Stephen, first of all, we need to talk about how we first met. You were given my name, but by our mutual connection in Boston, Michael Katz, because you were looking for a North American publicist for the commemorative China for the wedding of Prince William and Kate. And I just happened to have some pieces of that China here because we did connect through a referral, which I was very appreciative of. And we worked together on the promotion and PR 
for the commemorative china for the royal wedding of Prince William and Kate. That's absolutely right. And I remember it well. Um, Michael Katz of Blue Penguin Development, as far as I'm concerned, is the is the the king of uh, newsletter email marketing. He's, he's a wonderful, wonderful man. Um, and yeah, I contacted him and said, look, this royal wedding is coming up. It's a big part of our business, royal wedding gifts, and it'll be really big in the States. So ca do you know anybody, Michael, who will help us promote um, these products over in the States? And straight away, he came up with Nancy's name. And I'm so glad he did, because Nancy, you did a wonderful job for us during the entire period, six months running up to the wedding. I think we sold two plates and one and a half cups and sauces in the United States. So it was a great success. No, I'm joking. We sold, <laughs> we sold a lot, lots of products and, and your, your marketing expertise was terrific for us. We're very grateful. Yes, you know, I have some of this china still. And of course, the royal wedding of Prince William and Kate was on <clears throat> April 29th of 2011. And I know that we were in People magazine, and uh, that was one of our greatest uh, PR results. And I was looking for that. I know that somewhere in my files I have that magazine, and I, I was looking for it this morning, could not find it. But I'm going to look for it so we can take a screenshot and share it with the PR Maven Nation listeners. That would be great, yes. But that was a that was a great experience, and I'm very grateful that Michael made the introduction, and I was grateful that you had confidence in my team and me to help promote throughout the U.S. and Canada. And I have to be honest and say that this working on this project was one of the most exciting. PR projects of my entire career. And that's been a very long career. Steve. Well, that's, that's good to hear. <laughs> Lovely. Thank you. It was, it was really great. And, uh, and of course you and I made a connection and um, you know, we've, we've kept up perhaps not as closely as I would like. So I'm glad that we're having this opportunity today. To me, this is the power of having a podcast is being able to have a connection. You're over there in the UK and, and we're able to have this conversation yep. and share it with everyone in PR Maven Nation. Isn't it great? No, I'm, I'm absolutely delighted that you've um, reached out again, Nancy. And uh, yep, it's, uh, we shall certainly keep in touch better than we have till now. Yes. So what was your affiliation with the Royal Family? You owned Churches China, and um, you had a connection with the royal family. And what is your connection with the royals today? Well, the idea that I have an affiliation with the royal family makes me laugh. I mean, I, I, I'm probably about 4,380,641 in line to the throne. I mean, I have, I have no <laughs> affiliation with them whatsoever. Uh, we're, we're, we're not not related. and Neither would they want me to be related to them, I shouldn't think. Um, no, the the... The family business that, that um, I was heading up um, was begun in 1858 by my great great grandfather. And um, we kept going until 2012. But throughout the, the, the life of the business, um, royal events were very important to us uh, because there was always a great interest in commemorative events, whether it was the death of Queen Victoria or the coronation of King Edward VII, George V and all the others. Royal events were a big thing. They got bigger and bigger. And with the Americans becoming increasingly interested in our royal family, it was obviously a major um, uh, income stream for us. Um, uh, people collecting commemoratives from overseas. Yeah. But no, I, there, I have yeah. no other affiliation. <sighs> Well, I think we found that there were a lot of middle-aged women in the Midwest of the USA who were so interested in having this China. And that was something that we found, um, you know, again, when we were working on the PR for the Royal yes. Wedding. So yeah. there is a great fascination, obviously. And I mentioned to you that I have been watching The Crown <laughs> And it is mesmerizing. Yeah, you meant you, you. We're talking about the the, the royal family. Um, interestingly, 
Um, the, the royal family is probably more popular in the States than it is in the UK. Now, I have to choose my words very carefully. I'm a massive admirer of the late Queen, and I'm a massive admirer of her late husband. I'm an admirer of King Charles, who poor chap has just been diagnosed with cancer. And, and I think Prince William's a good chap. I'm an admirer of many of them, though not all, as people. And I think they have remarkable strength of character and integrity. And I think many of them do a remarkable job. But, and you can tell there's a but coming, I'm not an admirer of the institution. Now, that's not their fault. I'm not an admirer um, of this archaic institution that goes down over the centuries and has, until recent years, been a very cruel institution, which has um, committed all kinds of abuse on the subjects of, of the UK. So I, I don't like the idea of servility that they are that there are these this family that's way above us that we have to look up to. Um, but on the other hand, I. I'm also, I think the royal family as an institution is terribly unfair on its own members. I think it's really tough if you're born into the royal family. You're told you have no choice. You're told it, you're, it, it, you have a duty to serve the British people. And I don't think that's right, because clearly some people are better suited to it than others. I mean, the, some people say, oh, yeah, it must be great to have all that money and live in those castles and have all these footmen and the servants and someone to run your bath and and do everything for you to my mind it's a it's a kind of imprisonment it's a kind of hell you have no real freedom so i'm anti the institution but i'm a great admirer of many but not all of the royal family there we are you, you probably weren't expecting that monologue but you got it no 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 i appreciate it and uh i agree i think people um, think, oh, wouldn't that be so amazing to have all those servants and have to, people who cook for you and clean for you. And, but you also have the paparazzi, which, you know, and actually where I am now in the crown, you know, Lady mm -hmm. Diana is about to die mm -hmm. because uh, the photographers were chasing yeah. her in Paris. And I think, um, you know, it must be so intrusive. Yeah, uh, you know, I, I, I would say or... about the Crown. It's it's a fantastic series. It is um, a lot of it is fictional. Not 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 all of it. In fact, Princess Diana was born and brought up three miles from where I'm speaking to you now. Um, so she was. She wow. Was very... And where is that? Well, Steve? my hometown is uh, is Northampton. That's where I'm speaking to you from, um, and that's pretty much in the middle of the UK, about 60 miles north of London. And she was brought up at Althorpe House, which is um, three miles from where I am now. Um, in fact, when we finish, Nancy, I'll be riding my bicycle round the outside of Althorpe House for a bit of exercise. Yeah. Oh, well, and is there a museum there? Um, or is there you, a commemorative... Well, it's, it's um, not so much now, no. Um, you can visit, but it's not as easy as it was. The, the Crown, as I say, is terrific, wonderful acting, um, but take a lot of it with a pinch of salt. You know, some things did happen as they depict. Many things didn't happen as they depict. There's also right, an element yeah. I'm not very happy about. I think it's a, a little bit cruel. I mean, how do, the, how do Prince Harry and William feel about their mother being depicted in this way or, or that way? I think... In some ways, it's too soon and a bit unkind. Yeah, I know. I know. I I have two sons myself, and yeah, <laughs> I it, again, it's it's very intrusive. Yeah, um, but it's fine. It's it's um it's it's a it's great drama, and um yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So let's talk about Copywriter Pro. Right. Where are your clients and what kind of clients do you serve? Okay, that's a very good and intelligent question. I shall have to come up with a good and intelligent answer now. I'm, I'm very lucky um, in that I've got lots of different clients. Um, a lot of them are local, which is understandable. I do a, a lot of networking. I probably get about one third of my clients through networking, not always face-to-face, -face, obviously on Zoom as well. 
I'd probably get about a third from my website, which is well optimized. It should be because that's what I do, SEO. Um, and I get um, about a third from LinkedIn, which is really important for me. So my clients right. range from solo professionals like myself, people, people who are just freelance entrepreneurs. The majority of my um, clients are owners of SMEs, small to medium enterprises. Do you use the term SME in the States? Yeah. Yes, SMEs or SMEs. Yeah. Uh, yes, I have do. a few corporates. I'm increasingly getting customers from the States. In fact, I've just finished doing the website for a, um, a trampoline coach in California. So the variety, yeah, the variety is wonderful. I have a lot of clients um, who are accountants, um, a, a lot of um, service providers, a lot of professionals, uh, law firms, but really I am a generalist. So I love, what, one of the things I love about this job is, is, is the variety, just so many different types of clients with different backgrounds. The trouble is, Nancy, it means that I learn a dangerously small amount about lots of things. So I often start spouting as though I'm an expert where I'm not. Well, you're, you would make a wonderful guest at a cocktail party. Well, I don't, I'd probably empty the room very quickly. I'd, I'd be the kind of guest the host would want to bring in when they want everyone to go home. They get me to come on <laughs> and then they'd all leave very quickly. So, Stephen, I know that SEO has evolved. There was a day when we would do what we called keyword stuffing. So if we were trying to promote uh, public relations services, we would just write public relations service over and over in as many different ways as possible. But obviously, Google has gotten more sophisticated. So how do you write for search engines? Okay. Well, that's a very good question, and it could be a very long and involved answer, but um, we, we haven't got four and a half hours, have we, Nancy? But um, the first, okay, the answer to your question, how do you write for search engines? The answer is don't. Don't write for search engines. Write for your audience. Um, write in their language. Write for their field of interest. And the search engines will then um, give your web pages the best chance possible of reaching the top. It's, I mean, it's very difficult. There are something like 175,000 websites launched every single day. So to get yours to the top of your niche is a challenge, but it's not an impossible challenge. There are all kinds of bits and pieces you can do to give yourself the best chance. And you will know this, certainly Nancy, that the first thing to do is keyword research. So you look into the keywords that people are most likely to use. And often the best key phrase or, or keywords are the not most obvious one. Um, let's say you're opening an accountancy practice. Well, the word accountant, if you just use that as, as a keyword, you never get anywhere near the top. But if you put, let's say you live in a small town, um, accountant followed by that small town name will certainly help. So it's often a good idea to look for the um, less frequently used keywords. They're sometimes called long tail keywords because although they are right. searched for not near as often as the more obvious ones, when people do search for them, your web page will be near the top. So that's a, a little, if it's, a, if it's of any help, and I don't know how this works with, with the podcast, um, I've, I've produced an infographic with seven or eight really basic SEO tips and if somebody just messages me on LinkedIn, um, I'll very, very happily send that to them. Well, if you send that to Emma, we can include that in the show notes. That would be terrific. My pleasure. Thank My you. Pleasure. But yes, you make a very good point. So you said you recently worked with a trampoline coach. So you were, as you were writing, you were envisioning people that wanted trampoline coaching. Absolutely, yes. So you talk to the client about their target audience and you have to write in a tone of voice that reflects the business owner and the personality, the brand, your speciality, the brand of the business. But also you have to keep in mind with your tone of voice, the personality of who's going to be reading the website. And the one thing to focus on when you're doing your web copy 
something that many people forget or ignore, the most important thing is the benefit of the service that's being provided. How often have you seen a website where the opening paragraph of text might be, um, our company was formed in 1987. We've been doing this for so many years. We do this, we do that, we, 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 we. I tell you, when somebody visits a website, they want to know two things and two things alone. They want to know, what do these guys do? That's number one. Number two, how will I benefit from dealing with these guys? Right. It's all about benefit, benefit. And it's something that many people just don't seem to appreciate. Right. What I've thought about is how will they help me solve my greatest problems? That's it. Well, the, you're talking about pain points. You're quite right. Pain point and benefits are two sides of the same coin because the, the benefit of a service is solving the pain point that the person comes to them with. Yeah, I agree completely, Nancy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So what are the biggest challenges that you face as a copywriter? Biggest challenges, gosh. Well, staying awake during Zoom meetings, that's a bit of a challenge. <laughs> um, but okay, um, your trouble is, Nancy, you're asking these intelligent questions. I want to give great long answers. You're, you're getting me all, all excited now. Um, <laughs> the biggest challenge for a copywriter is as follows. It's getting across to people, communicating to people, the value of good copy. And that's something they right. don't understand. Sometimes I think it's probably with, with, with you. I mean, you a lot of what you do is re, it revolves around branding and marketing. Well, getting people to see the value of a clear brand must be a challenge for right. you. Some people say, yeah, well, I, I've got a logo. I've got my business name. I've got my website. I'm fine. Well, I sometimes think that you and I shouldn't be doing what we're doing, Nancy. We should be plumbers because with a plumber, Honestly, it's dead easy. It's crystal clear what a plumber does. And if you've got a if you've got a dripping tap, you know you're going to call a plumber and everyone's got a plumber in their phone. Not, not everyone has a copywriter in their phone. They call a plumber, the plumber, plumber comes round, fixes it. And when they've gone, you know straight away if they've done a good job or not. It's clear cut. The challenge for a plumber isn't convincing people of the value of plumbing. It's convincing people that they are the best of many plumbers. But the challenge for a copywriter, first of all, we have to convince people of the value of copy. And then we've got to convince them that I'm the copywriter that, that they need. And the reason for this is that 100 percent of able minded native English speakers, I'm choosing my words carefully, here, 100 percent of able minded native English speakers do English at school. Everybody does English. Many people are very good at it. It's a very popular subject. Many people love English. Many people get good grades at school and university in English. But here's the problem. Because of this, they think they don't need a copywriter. So many people, right. the, the reasons people give me for not hiring a copywriter, you know, I, I meet them at networking events and they'll say, oh, you're a copywriter. I don't need a copywriter. I got grade A English at, at school. Now, I have yet to see an English school syllabus where how to write effective commercial copy is part of that syllabus. The guy right. said to me two weeks ago, he said, oh, you're a copywriter. I don't need a copywriter. My wife's very good at grammar. And honestly, <laughs> I think that copywriting is, is all about grammar. Um, so copywriting is a craft. It's a skill. It's to do with psycholinguistics. It's to do with the different ways in which language affects different people and the impact it has on people and usually most people when they want their website copy doing um i, I, I ask them a question well what do you want your website to do and sometimes it takes them a while to be clear about that but good copy isn't um it's not necessarily long words or short words it's not good grammar or bad grammar good copy is copy that does the job, which usually means copy that sells. And that, that's, what, that's right. what good copy is. And it's quite a craft, it's quite a skill, but to answer your question about the biggest challenge as a copywriter is convincing people that they need a copywriter. To convince them right. that the job they've done themselves is rubbish and that they need me to rewrite it for them. That's right, yes. Well, I always think of 
you need to make a connection as a brand in people's brain, their, their mind and their heart. So I think effective copy not only communicates the facts, but also conveys a feeling and, and that's sort of an amorphous oh, yeah. way, you know, there, there is a certain feeling of well-written copy that, that's like a magnet. It it attracts the right Nancy, people. Nancy, you are speaking my language. I can't show it to you, but above me, in front of me here, is a poster. And it's a poster has a picture of a lady, an American lady, who is my copywriting hero or heroine, Maya Angelou, the late, great Maya Angelou, the poet, the author, philosopher. And you just said good copy is about feeling. Now, do you know the quote I'm about to say? Maya Angelou said, Yes, I do. People may forget what you said. They may forget what you did, but they will never forget how you made them feel. And that's what good copy is all about, about making people feel. And if ever I'm stuck with some copywriting, I look up at Maya and she reminds me of, about what I should be doing. Well, it, I'm so glad you brought up that quote because, you know, I do keynote speaking and that quote is the centerpiece of my speech because it's true. People will never forget how you made them Absolutely. feel. And a lot of that is acknowledging them as individuals and, and humans who, who are unique. Absolutely right. And yes. they want to be recognized and validated. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Sure. Well, Stephen, we're going to take a short break now. And I want to remind our listeners and viewers that they can get a copy of or the first chapter of my book, which is called Grow Your Audience, Grow Your Brand, by going to prmaven.com slash giveaway. And you can sign up to receive uh, that chapter and be on our email list. And we'll be back in just a moment with more from Stephen Church of Copywriter Pro. Sprague & Curtis is a locally owned real estate company. We're primarily focused in central Maine. Uh, I got excited about Nancy's book because she's so well known in the area for her marketing and branding techniques and uh, we're always looking to expand and learn and grow and um, so a, a lot of us here at the office decided that we wanted to uh, read her book and learn some new techniques. It benefits Sprague and Curtis to have a large brand and audience um, because there can often be uh, multiple years between transactions with clients, um, so it's important to network them with them and, and stay in touch with them in those in-between periods. And this book really helped us uh, learn some techniques and methods to, to continue to do that. We organized a small book group with Nancy's book uh, with brokers in our office this winter to share information and remind ourselves how important it is to always be working on our network and continually reaching out to our customers. Platforms like social media are important in expanding your business, but equally as important are handwritten notes, cards, letters. She inspired me to send her a note of appreciation, just thanking her for the book and her insight. In reading Nancy's book, I was excited to look to continue to grow our brand and our audience. I think she does a great job of um, motivating us. Nancy's book really helped me learn a few things in marketing and branding and how important it is to stay on top of reaching out to clients periodically, staying top of mind, providing useful information, and, and really telling our story as a company. Okay, so welcome back to the PR Maven podcast. And remember that you can get the free first chapter of my book by going to prmaven.com slash giveaway. And today I'm very happy to be talking with Stephen Church, who's all the way across the ocean in the UK. And uh, Stephen is uh, the owner now of Copywriter Pro. However, I met him back when my agency was doing the public relations for the commemorative China for the royal wedding of Prince William and Kate. And of course, now um, we're very sad that King Charles has had a cancer diagnosis. And I've seen that Stephen um, 
Prince William has stepped up and taken on more royal responsibilities uh, to, to let his father go through his cancer treatments. So, um, of course, who do you think writes the speeches for the royals? Well, I understand that um, certainly the Queen and, and Prince Philip and I believe King Charles um, do a lot of their own writing, but they will have people who will do some for them. They'll have people who will make suggestions. I guess it's collaborative, but I also believe that um, it's, it, their, their voices are very strong in the speeches as, as well. Yeah. Well, um, one thing, I'm a big advocate of letter writing, handwritten letters in the mail. We were talking uh, before we started here about the high cost of postage, which is such a shame because I have always enjoyed writing letters in the mail. And I know that that's a habit that many of the monarchy have is uh, sitting down at their desk and writing a letter to someone. So that is a habit that I hope, I, I feel like I taught my two sons how to write letters in the mail. I do get thank you notes from them yeah. after their That's first so They, they still write, do they, Nancy? Yes, they do. They they know that is it is expected of them. Very good. <laughs> I'm most impressed. You wouldn't want to receive a letter from me. You'd never be able to read it. My handwriting's all over the place. <laughs> I think the point is just the thought, yeah. really. It's the thought of putting pen to paper. That's right. And that is a very good segue to my next question, which is about artificial intelligence. What do you think about AI? And do you think that artificial intelligence is going to replace human copywriters? Gosh. Well, yeah, don't say it too loudly because my wife's looking for something to replace me. So if she hears this, she'll go and sign up for AI or something to replace me. I'm sure she'd prefer <laughs> that. Yes. Um, well, about 15 months ago, so at the end of, of 2022, I started reading about and finding out about AI, particularly chat GPT. And I was concerned. I remember for several months, every day on the BBC website, there was another article about what was coming, the coming storm. And I remember seeing an article which was headlined, which jobs will be the first to go to be replaced by AI? And top of the BBC's list was copywriting. So I thought, goodness, I'm going to have to go for an interview to my local supermarket. They'll want someone to stack shelves, which I wouldn't have minded because I, I very much like my local supermarket. Uh, but I was seriously concerned about the future of copywriters. But in fact, um, the more I've um, read about it, looked at it and used it, I'm not ashamed to say I use it, but we can discuss how in, in a little while, the more I believe that um, certainly in the short term, in the near future, it won't replace copywriters. It might replace the bad ones, the lazy ones, but uh, it's a remarkable tool and it, it, can, it can do wonderful things. It can be very good for research, but of course you have to be, you have to be skeptical about the answers it gives because it's only getting the information off the World Wide Web and that doesn't mean it's necessarily accurate. But it's, um, I'll, can I give you an example of how it's helped me with my copywriting? Yes, of course. Okay, I have a client who does something similar to what you do. She's a, she's a public speaking coach. And she, I do web copy for her and I do blogs for her. And she asked me about oh, six or nine months ago to produce a blog which highlights the benefits of public speaking skills to small business owners. Now, what I would have done pre-AI, I'd have had a little think, got my pen and paper, and I'd have come up with two or three ideas, two or three benefits of public speaking skills to small business owners. I jotted them down. Then I'd have gone on Google and I'd have done some searching and I would have come up with lots of articles and blogs. Some of them I would have read and they would have given me no information, a waste of my time. Some of them I'd have got one or two ideas. And I might have finished up with maybe six or seven benefits of public speaking skills for small business owners. And using that information, I'd have constructed a blog. 
but I put the question into chat GPT, give me benefits of public speaking skills to small business owners. And you know what? It came up with 17 benefits, some of which I'd never thought of. So as I was able to use this information to come up with a really comprehensive blog. And I don't know whether you're familiar with, with, with the term. It was it was so comprehensive that my, my client was able to say, well, that blog's great. We've got a long blog now with 17 benefits of public speaking skills. I was then able to write a blog about each of those skills, which links into the pillar blog. So we call those shorter blogs, cluster blogs, which linked into the long pillar blog. And just with the information that chat GPT was able to give me, I was able to come up with a much more comprehensive piece of work than would otherwise have been the case. So I don't know if that helps explain one of the benefits of chat GPT and the like. Definitely. Yes. So I think what you're saying, Stephen, is that AI is not going to replace humans, but it may actually help us. There are people who are using AI to write blogs and well, that's fine. That's OK. The results they get will be OK. And their competitors that are doing the same will will be writing blogs which are OK and very much like all the other blogs, which are OK. But none of these blogs will be speaking truly with the voice and the spirit and the soul of the writer. And that's something which AI can't do yet. I'm not being complacent. I don't know what's around the corner. No one does. But if you want um, a blog which has fizz and buzz and spirit and soul, then AI won't give you that. It'll give you a blog that's OK. That's right. Yeah. We, 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 but we need human. Yeah, what we want is, is writing that is authentic and human. Yeah. Right. And again, as we said previously, that connects with other people's hearts Absolutely. and minds. Absolutely. I, I think the, the moment I start using AI to write blogs, my poster of Maya Angelou will suddenly drop from the wall onto the floor in protest. Yeah. <laughs> so, Stephen, what social media platforms do you use the most? You had mentioned LinkedIn, but do you use others? And do you think that public relations people should focus more on social media or e-newsletters when communicating with their clients and customers? Gosh. Well, uh, there are several questions there. I'll try and answer the first one, by which time I'll have forgotten the other two. And you, you'll have to remind <laughs> Yes, I use social media, but I really only use one. I use LinkedIn. Um, I'm not a great fan of Facebook. I just, I don't know whether it's because I'm a typical upright, privately educated Englishman, but I don't like sharing all my stuff, all my personal stuff. I don't like reading other people's personal stuff. So I'm not, not very keen on Facebook. I've got a Facebook personal profile, which I probably look at once a month. Um, and um, I've got uh, a Facebook page for Copywriter Pro, which I probably should use more, but I don't. So for me, it's LinkedIn, Twitter or X. I've got an account, but I'm not interested. I should probably be using Instagram. I'm thinking of getting in. It's part of my marketing plan for this year. And part of that is to get into to try TikTok. Maybe very short videos comprising copywriting tips would be a good idea. I don't know. So I need to learn more about social media. But for me, it's all about LinkedIn. It's very, very good for me. I get lots of connections and lots of work from LinkedIn. So I'm not one to dictate to people um, which platforms they should be using. That's for a social media expert to decide. Well, I will say that from my experience, LinkedIn is very recognized and I don't know if you'd say respected by the search engines. So if you put a very good description of your services in the about section of your LinkedIn, uh, Google and the other search engines will, will yeah. see well, that. You kindly, you kindly allowed me to promote an infographic I produced about SEO. I've also produced one about 
LinkedIn profiles, about 11 tips for a great LinkedIn profile. So we could put that in the notes as well. We would love like. that. That would be great. Mm -hmm. Yes, I do know from experience Lots. that a lot of people will just put sort of their resume in the about section, but that's really a place where you, you go beyond the resume, right? Absolutely. I mean, LinkedIn's wonderful. That about section is like having a free web page. Yeah. And it should be, it needs to be, I mean, unless you're using LinkedIn um, in order to further your career to help, help you get a job or a promotion, that's different. But LinkedIn should, you should think about the about section as a web page, as promoting the services. And again, more than anything, promoting the benefits of the services and the, 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 the pain points that people Want, want resolving. I mean, my LinkedIn about section, I think it begins something along the lines of, hi, my name's Stephen Church from Copywriter Pro. I'm an SEO copywriter. That's enough about me. What about you? Are you a this? Are you a that? Are you the other? So straight away, people feel I'm talking to them about their problems. Oh, that's that great. That's a great advice. Uh, great tip. Yeah. But you just mentioned that even if you're looking for a job, I believe that if you're looking for a job, that's that's a place that you should talk about your superpowers and why you're the best candidate for that job and and your personality yeah. and your your skills and abilities uh, are the best. Yes, yes. But when I'm helping people with their about sections, people who are looking for for promotion or or, or looking for a job, again, I try and of course it must be about them. Um, but I try and get them to stress the benefits that they will bring to an employer. Right, exactly. You know, always, always benefits. Yeah. So what is the single most important and effective element of effective copywriting? Well, clarity. Um, I mean, my my kind of my strap line, which I, I think you kindly promoted, is that uh, is clear, concise and compelling. So clarity is really important and being concise, which is something I, as you all have learned today that I'm not really good at being concise I never stop talking. And of course, being compelling, which means really um, turning people on to to the, 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 the message you're trying to get across. The single most important aspect of copywriting, I think, I think it's probably benefits. I know you probably think I'm going on, going on too long. I, can I tell a little story about benefits? Sure, because I, I do. Just think it, it's so important. It. Um, I once did a website many years ago for an optician, and he was well, still is. He's a wonderful chap who really knows his stuff about glasses about what the frames are made of, what the lens is made of, and, and, and the different kinds of coating you can have on the lenses. And he's so passionate and enthusiastic. The trouble is, he loves talking to his customers about these features of the glasses he's selling, that the frames are made out of some amazing t titanium alloy that was developed after NASA sent a spaceship to the moon or, or something like that. And he's very articulate and he tells people about the special coating on the lenses that will be anti-glare. And he, he will talk endlessly about the features of his product. But when you go to an optician, you want to know two things. You want to, you want to get yourself a pair of glasses that will make you see better and look good. And those are benefits. And this chap wasn't interested talking about the benefits. He just wanted to talk about the features. And people, that's a kind of secondary interest for people, the, the features. They want to know whether the glasses they're buying will make them see better and look good. Um, so really, I think the secret to effective copywriting, if, they're, if you're writing for a service or a product, is to communicate the benefits. Yes. Even when it comes, to, and, and this can happen, um, this is not just in the, the body of, of the web copy. On the uh, on the homepage of a website, the banner should, just in a, in a very concise phrase or sentence or two, stress the benefits there. Then in the opening bit of copy on a web page, the benefits, 
even the calls to action, and ideally a call to action shouldn't be just a button at the very bottom saying contact us or click here. You should have several calls to action going down the page. But each call to action shouldn't just be a button saying click here or contact us. It should give people a reason for clicking that button. In other words, a benefit for clicking it. So let's say I'm doing a website for an accountancy practice. It won't be just contact us on a button. It'll be find out how to save time and money. Click here. So you give people a reason, give them a benefit for the call to action. Right. Okay, good. So does that answer your question? Yes, definitely. Thank you. I think the, the word benefit is the key word here that we're talking about. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Stephen, is it. there? I see you have a lot of books there behind you. Is there a... Yeah, I have. I'm, I'm going to have to learn to read, aren't I, Nancy? <laughs> yeah. It's, it's actually, it's completely fake. They're not real. Yeah, there are fake backdrops you can... No, but, but there's a big gap on that bookshelf, a, a massive gap. It's just off camera. It's the gap that where your book is going oh, to go. Oh, good. Yes. Well, you might be receiving one of those in the mail. So just... Uh... I want to buy one. Okay, good. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> other than my book, is there another book or a podcast other than this one or an app that has helped you in your career and why? There are so many. My goodness. Um, give me a moment. Okay. I don't know. Um, I tell you what, there's the one, this one, which was the one that I very first um, bought when I decided to set up copyright. Hold it up Pro. again, please. Yeah, sorry. It's this one. Right, copy, you, make you, money by Andy Maslin. 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 Yeah, he's an English copywriter, and the reason it's good, it's it's got a lot of stuff about how how to write copy, but then so have a lot of the other books here. But it's also if 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 somebody is thinking of taking up copywriting, they should buy books. But this is the first one they should buy because it's as much about setting up your own business and sorting out a business plan. Um, it helps you how, how to set your prices. Lots of stuff like that, as well as how to write copy. So that's the first one um, I bought, but there are so many others and I can't think of one in particular that I would recommend amongst all the others, I'm afraid. Well, I think the message may be that if you want to be a writer, you must be a reader. <laughs> oh, yes. Yes. Have, have we, we haven't touched on that's something. I'm, I don't know how we are for time, but that's another thing I'm very, very passionate about. I do have lots of connections with people who want to take up copywriting. And I've had several come to visit me on more than one occasion, or we have Zoom chats. And Sometimes they're young people and they maybe they've just left university and they've done journalism or something. And the first question I asked them, I said, tell me, what are you reading now? And many of them go, well, <laughs> nothing. Really. And sometimes, I mean, I wouldn't want to put people off, but sometimes I think people shouldn't be allowed to become copywriters till they're, they're at least 68, <laughs> which is how old I am. Um, I do think that the people who write best are the people who read best. And I think reading is so important. It, it, it really is. And I'm not talking about business books. I, I learn as much about writing where, through reading fiction as I do about books about writing. Um, it really is important to, to read fiction, to, to learn a, about people and, and what moves them and to learn about language. And a very good book I should have pulled out, which is up there, is by your own countryman, the um, thriller writer Stephen King. And he's written a wonderful book, um, which is called, I think it's called How to Write. Yes. But it's, it's you know, it's in two parts. Well, he's the from first my part home is, state of Maine, you know. Is he? He's a Maine. Well, congratulations. Yes. Well Thank done. Thank you. Uh, the first half of the book is an autobiography, but it's about his, his life through the, the, the lens of, of writing. So it's, it's a sort of writing autobi autobiography. And the second half of the book is about how to write well. And that's a really good book. Yes. 
And it's no coincidence that he and his wife, Tabitha, are big patrons of libraries. They have donated to many libraries around our state, and that's been very Good. appreciated. And next Tuesday, Valentine's Day. Do you have Valentine's Day in the yes, States? Yes, yes. Well, it's not just Valentine's Day for romantics. It's also Love Your Library Day. And I have a LinkedIn post going out on Valentine's Day as well about loving your oh, library. Oh, that's nice. They're, they're under great threat in this country. I know. Uh, everywhere, I think. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Stephen, if people want to follow up, I think that you're going to tell them to look at your LinkedIn. But is there another way also you would like them to connect with you? Well, indeed, my website is copywriterpro.co.uk. Copywriterpro.co.uk. That's the one. Okay, great. And they can also look for Stephen Church on LinkedIn, and that's Stephen with a PH. It is Stephen with a PH, and there may be other Stephen Churches, but if you put in Stephen Church copywriter, then that'll be that'll be fine. Great. And um, I do. I'm very happy to have one to ones with people. I'm happy to give people quick web website reviews so i'm always always happy to help in any way i can oh that's a very nice offer yes and i also wanted to once more hold up this beautiful <laughs> royal wedding china which is how we connected back in 2011 it is Nancy, time ago. that's right never to be forgotten that's right well, Stephen, thank you for joining me today. And I, I know everyone in PR Maven Nation enjoyed learning more about your services, and I hope that they will connect with you. Well, you've been really kind. I've I've enjoyed this conversation. And you've done well, Nancy. You stayed awake for most of it. <laughs> many, many wouldn't. So congratulations. You're funny. <laughs> Have a great day, Stephen. And you. Bye-bye, Nancy. Bye, bye. bye, everybody. Thanks for listening to this episode of the PR Maven podcast. I invite you to share a review of the podcast on iTunes or your favorite podcast player. Be sure to subscribe to our podcast so you never miss an episode. You can also join the PR Maven Nation on Facebook. It's free to join and it's a great community of like-minded individuals who are all looking to learn and grow from one another. If you use an Alexa device, use your Alexa app to search the skills and games section to find and enable the PR Maven podcast flash briefing. This will give you access to exclusive content and more PR and marketing advice. Thanks again for listening and have a great rest of your week, PR Maven Nation.